Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our session as we talk about balance in life and uh, focus in on our marital relationships. I am Crystal Tyler Mackey with Virginia Cooperative Extension, happy to host the session today. And I am going to quickly turn it over to our expert. Uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Megan Zobin McNabb. She's Virginia Tech's um, Director of the Marriage and Family Therapy Doctoral Program, and she's going to come on and give us some tips and also be available and ready to answer the questions that we'll have uh, on today. We'll be posting those questions in the chat box on today, and I will work with her to monitor those questions as well. So thank you all and join me in welcoming Dr. Dobin McNabb. Good morning, Crystal. Thanks for inviting me and good morning to everyone who's joining in this session. I hope you're all taking good care of yourselves and staying healthy during these very unusual and challenging times. Um, as Crystal said, my name is Megan Dalbin McNabb. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Human Development and Family Science. Um, and I also serve as director of Virginia Tech's Marriage and Family Therapy Doctoral Program. Um, in addition to that, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. So I've been working with couples and families clinically for uh, quite a few years now as well. Um, so my plan um, before I get to answering your questions is to talk a little bit about the impact of social distancing, which we're all doing right now to slow the spread of COVID-19 on our marital and partner relationships. Um, and I'm going to try to offer some ideas about how to take care of your relationship um, during this time. So that's kind of what I'll do. And then I'm happy to take questions um, and see what I can do uh, to be of assistance um, to all of you who are joining in. Um, so I think one of the things that many people are experiencing right now, and myself included, is that couples are experiencing a lot of stress right now. Um, I don't know about you all, but I am juggling a lot of tasks. I am working full time from my home, caring for my children who need snacks and help and get bored and need suggestions of things to do. Um, I'm also trying to help them navigate online school. Um, turns out I'm not as good at fractions as I thought I was. Um, some of you may be caring for older adults. You've got the regular housework going. Um, so people are juggling a lot. Um, I'm fortunate my kids are a little bit older, but I have family members who have very young children and just balancing all of those needs can be very stressful. Um, but on a more serious level, you know, many of us are dealing with really significant stressors, perhaps loss of income because of being out of a job. With that can come a loss of health insurance. Maybe there are some financial struggles in terms of making ends meet, fear about the, your safety, the health and well-being of your loved ones. There are any number of things that are really putting couples under a lot of stress right now. And one of the things that we know is that when couples get under stress, there are a few things that tend to happen. One of the things is those a little annoyances or habits that you can overlook suddenly become major sources of tension and conflict, right? You're together all of the time. And the fact that your partner doesn't ever take their dishes to the kitchen or whatever those little things are suddenly can become really irritating and really annoying and become major sources of conflict and stress. The other thing that can happen for couples um, when they're together a lot and under a lot of stress is that sometimes unresolved sources of conflict can bubble up again. Um, and so maybe there's something about, you know, feeling unappreciated by your partner or feeling like they're not really helping you out enough or whatever can kind of pop up again um, when we're experiencing stress and together all of the time. And so that's something that many couples may be experiencing as well. Um, and one of the other things that happens is that when we get under stress, we often revert to old ways of interacting or patterns of behavior that can put further strain on a couple relationship. So let's say that when you're somebody who feels really stressed, you try to control everything. Um, and that can be really frustrating or irritating to a partner. Um, or maybe you're somebody who, when you're experiencing a lot of stress, you kind of say, I can't handle this right now. I need to, I need to take a break. Um, that can create tension, particularly if your partner is somebody who really wants to talk things through, hash things out, and you're saying, I need a little bit of space right now. So when we get under stress, sometimes we're not always behaving at our best, um, and, and there can be tension um, with our partners over things that maybe normally we'd be able to overlook or would not be as big of a deal. 
Um, and so all of this is to say that the stress of the current circumstances, spending a lot of time together can really strain even relationships that are very strong and couples that are very connected. Um, now, what's interesting is I've seen some, some news stories coming out of China saying that there may be increased divorce rates coming um, from COVID-19. There's a lot of um, information in the media about how to sort of divorce proof your relationship during COVID-19. Um, and I, so I think there are a lot of experts that are really worried about the impact of this on couple relationships. I think we'll have to see what happens. Um, but I think the idea is, is that this stress and particularly the financial stress can be really detrimental for many couples. And so part of my reason for being here today is to help offer some thoughts about how to take care of your relationships. Um, during this time. The other thing that is a concern that people have right now is social distancing may put some people at risk for domestic violence or other behavior that is abusive or controlling. Um, and so for people who are in situations where they feel unsafe, there are real good resources available. One is the National Domestic Violence Hotline, which can be reached at 1-800-799-SAFE or 1-800-799-7233. If calling isn't an option, you can text LOVE IS to 22522. So what I wanna do now is shift over to talking about some different ways that you can think about taking care of your relationship as we're all navigating this social distancing. I'm doing it too. Um, my husband and I were joking that we should have like a little fight in the middle of this, um, but we decided we decided to pass on that today. Um, but one of the first things I would offer as ways to take care of your couple relationship during this time is to that it's okay to take a break from each other. It's okay to say, you know what, I need a little time to myself. I need a little time alone. And during that time, try to do things that recharge you. Um, not housework, not work, catching up on work that you need to do, but things that really fill you up. Um, it's really hard to be a good partner, and I would add a good parent when your batteries are empty or low. So if you can take a break, take a little walk outside if you live in a place where you can do that. Um, if you have a place in your home where you can get a little space to yourself, that's really important. Um, you know, sometimes it may just be, I'm going to go watch something on TV. I'll see you later. But, but it, it is okay to take, take that time and take a break. Uh, I think the other thing that's important to remember is that both you and your partner are under, maybe under a lot of stress right now, and really nothing is normal. I know in my house, we've had to completely readjust our schedules, how we do things around our house. Um, and so and for that reason, I think it's important to try to be flexible and patient um, and forgiving of your partner um, and try to give each other the benefit of the doubt when you can. Um, and I also think that maintaining a sense of humor during these times is really important as well. Um, sometimes sort of laughing when things don't quite go the way you thought they would um, becomes a really important piece of all of this. And so just giving each other a little bit of benefit of the doubt can really go a long way, particularly when we're under stress. Now, one of the things that I've noticed, at least for myself, and I think is, is really important for couples to remember is that what you need and experience is going to differ day to day and hour to hour. So you might find that your needs and experiences are a bit mismatched. So I've had days where I have felt more stressed and my, my partner has been a little bit more like, this is okay. And then there are days when we flipped. Um, and I think it's good to remember that you're not always gonna line up in terms of, kind of how stressed you're feeling, how worried you might be. Maybe you're both doing pretty well that day. Um, and so wherever you land, it's really important to recognize that each other's experience is valid um, and to make space and allow for your partner to feel how they are feeling that day um, without trying to sort of argue with them about it or challenge that, but, but to be accepting and validating of what they're, they're particularly experiencing on a given day. Um, so one of the things that I think um, is really important is to think about uh, working together as a team. Um, and so 
couples may need to really renegotiate routines and patterns. Who does what around the house? Who does things with the kids? Um, kind of come up with a new schedule. Predictability is really important. We know that for children. I think it's very important for families and can really help couples out as well. If this is kind of how our day is going to go. This is what we're going to be doing. Um, and again, this may involve dividing up tasks and responsibilities in ways that are different or new that what, than what you've done before. Um, and I think it's important for couples to try to be flexible and to, to share the workload when they can um, so that people do have room to take a break if they need to or to juggle all of those multiple responsibilities that they're dealing with. Now, of course, to do this, communication is really key, right? Um, we have to be able to communicate effectively when we need to renegotiate how we do things um, or to express our needs or concerns to our partner or to perhaps confront them if something isn't going the way that we um, would like it to or that it should be going. Um, and so I think one of the things that's really important for couples to do is to take some time to really check in with each other. Um, you know, how are you doing? How are things going for you today? You know, I think it's really easy for people to kind of just go with the tasks, right? The stuff that has to get done. I've certainly had days where I got to the end of the day and was like, Oh, how am I doing today? And so checking in with your partner to say, you know, how, how's your day been? How are, you go, how are you doing? How are you feeling right now? Is what we're doing working right now? And when you ask that question and check in, it's very important to actually listen and hear what the other person says. Most people are pretty bad listeners. We think we listen, but we don't necessarily take in what the other person is saying because we're kind of thinking about what we think about it or what we're gonna say next. And so really listening and hearing hearing what your partner is saying and validating their experiences. You might not agree with it, um, but you can still validate it and you can say, wow, that sounds like that was really hard. Um, or yeah, I'd be upset about that too. Or I can understand how you feel that way. So you don't have to agree, but you can still listen and validate what the person is telling you. And I think it's important to try to put yourself in your partner's shoes and for them to put themselves in your shoes to try to understand what their point of view is on whatever the situation is you're discussing. And when you can do that, oftentimes it's easier to find solutions and reach compromise where you can kind of take each other's perspective and say, okay, I can see how you could see it this way. This is how I can see it. Where can we kind of meet in the middle? Now, I think the other thing that's important to remember with communication is when we get upset or angry, um, which is normal and that's totally fine, it happens. Um, sometimes therapists talk about it about getting flooded. We get flooded with emotion. And when that happens, it can be very difficult to think clearly um, and communicate productively. Um, and so if you're finding yourself in a situation where you're really upset or angry with your partner, it's a good idea to stop, take a few moments to calm down. That may mean you need to say, I need to come back to this conversation later, or I need to take a break. And when you're in that space of trying to kind of calm down, it's useful to ask yourself, you know, what am I really upset about? Am I really upset about the fact that there's a pile of shoes by the front door? Or is it that I'm actually upset because I feel like my partner's not helping out around the house the way that I would like them to and everybody's making a giant mess right now in my house. And I think my partner needs to pitch in a little bit more. So to really find out, kind of ask yourself, you know, what is it that I'm really mad about? Is, you know, is it something else or is it this particular issue? Um, and once you figured that out and you're a little bit calmer, that's the time to kind of come back and have a dialogue with your partner about how you're feeling and what you're experiencing. And then again, of course, listening becomes very important. I think right now it's really important for couples in their communication to be very clear about what you're asking for and what you need in terms of support and assistance. Um, you know, being able to very specifically articulate, I really need you to help more with taking care of the kids during the day so that I can get some work done. Or I need you to take the kids for a little bit so that I can get a break or whatever it happens to be. But to be very specific and clear about your needs for assistance and support. Um, we don't do real well when we attempt to mind read. Um, and so don't expect your partner to be a mind reader and don't mind read your partner. Um, I think it's really important to dialogue about what each other really needs so that you can actually be there to be supportive of each other. 
Um, one of the things to look out for, particularly when we get upset or angry, is sometimes we will engage in problematic ways of communicating. So we might criticize our partners, um, or we might say something kind of nasty um, because we're just so frustrated, or we can get defensive, or sometimes we'll say, I just don't even want to talk about this right now, and we kind of walk away. Um, all of those things can be really corrosive um, or damaging for a couple relationship, particularly if they're happening over time. Um, and so in instead of doing those things, again, once you calm down, um, I think it's valuable for couples to try to use what we call I statements. Um, and so instead of saying, you never help around the house right now, um, which can make somebody defensive, it's more productive to say, I feel hurt when I'm the person who's doing all of the housework around here. I would like it if you could help with more of the housework. It sounds a little different. It's a little less, when we use you statements, it's oftentimes people get defensive and they don't even hear the rest of the statement. They hear you, blah, 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 blah. And they go right to a place of defensiveness. But if we can start a statement by saying, I need or I feel this way when this happens, oftentimes we can get people to engage a little bit more in productive dialogue. The other kind of discussions that can be useful are we conversations. You know, we, we've got to figure out how to organize our schedule so that we both can get some work done and take care of the kids or whatever the we issue is. But making it an issue that you want to solve together um, sometimes can go a long way instead of it being something that is a source of conflict but is a challenge that you can kind of confront together. I think the other piece of all of this is there are times where we're going to mess up and we're going to do things that are hurtful um, to our partners. And in those cases, it's important to take responsibility for those actions and be able to apologize um, and to expect the same from our partners as well. Um, um, as, as we navigate these difficult times, sometimes it's important just to say, I'm really sorry, I, I should have done more of this, or I, I could have responded better to that and to be able to, to talk about that. And again, coming back to the importance of really being being able to listen um, and hear what your partner is experiencing. Um, I think this is also a good time for couples to, if they can, nurture their couple relationships. Um, you know, sometimes I think that we can kind of lose sight of the reasons why we really love and appreciate our partners. And so this is a time perhaps to maybe do some small things that you know make your partner feel really loved and appreciated. Now, some of us will say, why should I do that? They're annoying me. They're not helping out the way I would like. We're, we're fighting all the time. Um, one of the things that uh, that we have seen, at least in research um, and in other places, is that sometimes positivity breeds positivity. And so for couples, sometimes doing things that are ways of expressing love and appreciation kind of will breed that. And it becomes um, a thing where, you know, oh, if they are appreciating me, I'm going to do something to appreciate them. So those can be some valuable ways to nurture a couple relationship. Um, expressing gratitude as well um, for the things that your partner is doing to help you out, um, especially as we're navigating these challenging and difficult times. So saying thank you to things. Um, considering kind of a at-home date night um, can be useful um, or just doing something you enjoy doing together um, or finding a way to reconnect over something that you used to enjoy doing um, as a couple, perhaps before the busyness of life and other responsibilities um, catches up. And so just finding ways to, to also nurture the relationship, spend some time together in ways that are fun and enjoyable, I think is really important. Um, one of the things um, for some people, um, and I think sex can be a tricky territory in all of this, is for some people, sex can be a really great form of stress relief um, and a way of feeling connected. For other people, when they feel really stressed, sex is like the last thing on their mind. Um, and so I think it's really important for couples to communicate openly about this topic um, and to really talk about how they feel um, about sex um, and to kind of try to come to some agreement that feels comfortable to them. The other thing that I would add is, you know, while we're socially distancing, it doesn't mean we need to get rid of our social connections. So I think one of the things that would be really helpful is to continue to nurture your social connections. You know, connect with friends and family. Um, 
do virtual game night or connect and have dinner with extended family from a distance or whatever your circumstances happen to be. Get together with a group of friends to talk about um, how things are going. You know, having those outlets of talking to other people and maintaining those social connections, even from a distance, um, can also be really good for couple relationships to have other adults um, to connect to and other people out there as in the in the world. Um, and it can also take the strain off of the couple in terms of having to be the only only source of support or adult interaction depending on your circumstances. Um, and so with all of that said, there may be couples that, you know, will come, are going through this and again are experiencing a lot of stress or strain. Um, there are options. Um, many uh, therapists are providing teletherapy right now um, and providing services to couples and families remotely. And so that may be a possibility for couples that are really struggling right now. Um, again, for people who are in situations where they feel unsafe, the National Domestic Violence hotline is available at 1-800-799-7233 or texting love is to 22522. So there are resources out there um, for couples and so I think people who are experiencing just an exorbitant amount of stress and strain and a lot of conflict and tension um, may find some of those resources to be very helpful. So that's what I have to share. I'm happy to take questions um, and try to address any you know, issues that you may have, things you might like some insight on, and we'll see where we go from there. So at this point, I've um, put those two resources into the chat box, the um, National Domestic Violence Hotline number, as well as the text number. Uh, we are recording, and we will share the recording. We are looking to um, host these recordings for the entire Balancing Life series on the Virginia Cooperative Extension webpage, but feel free to uh, reach out if you need something a little sooner. Uh, and we would love to hear or, or read your questions in the chat box while we have this amazing opportunity to have Dr. Dobin McNabb on with us. Mm -hmm. So I see the question, uh, great tips, but any suggestions when a spouse is beginning dementia? Um, so I think that um, a couple things with that. I think one is if a spouse is having signs of dementia or mild cognitive impairment, certainly there may be some medical um, kind of needs that need to be managed. And of course, I understand that's really complicated right now um, in terms of accessing medical care. I think that um, for, if, if a spouse is experiencing signs of dementia, I think getting support from other relatives and friends in terms of social interaction is really important. I think um, having routines um, can be very important um, in terms of a spouse with signs of dementia so that um, kind of the routine and plan for the day is consistent. Um, if there's a way of getting help or support from people that without um, unnecessarily exposing um, so that a caregiver can get a break, I think that's really important. I realize that that's not always very easy, um, but that may be useful as well. Um, so I think those are my thoughts. Um, I think that's a challenge, that can be a challenging situation, but I would say trying to get support um, if possible. Um, and, and again, trying to sort of set routines um, and to find ways of connecting with that spouse or partner um, that fits with what their capabilities are. Um, you know, maybe reading or listening to music or other, other ways of spending time or connecting together um, that fit with those capabilities. So those are my, my thoughts there. Um, but I think, you know, reaching out for support becomes really important um, as well. Friends, family, professionals, that type of thing. Other questions about things that are going well? Anybody has success stories to share? Challenges that you've run into? Oh, this is a good one. Tips differ with newly married couples or those married a long time. Um, yeah, so I think a couple things related to that. Um, sometimes for newly married couples, um, 
you know, this could be, I've heard, you know, a few newly married couples be like, wow, this is like a kind of like a honeymoon, you know, we get to spend all this time together. Um, but that's not always necessarily the case just because you're a newly married couple. Um, I think that one of the differences is for longer married couples. Um, I think it's important, you may have a longer history together in terms of perhaps issues that haven't been resolved. Um, and I think that's where that communication becomes important no matter how long you've been married. I think for, for couples who have been married a long time, really listening and dialoguing um, to each, uh, with each other is really important. Um, I think there's a comfort that couples who have been together a long time may have. So they may really have a lot of resources that they can draw on from previous experiences in their marriage um, to be there to support each other. And so recognizing some of the ways that you cope um, and have coped as a couple, particularly if you've been together a long time, to draw on those strengths um, is really important. I think for newly married couples, that communication is really critical to setting a strong connection of support and encouragement for each other. So those are my thoughts with, with that. Um, I see a question about ideas for ways to spend quality time together while in quarantine. Um, I think it's easy to, for couples sometimes at the end of a busy day of juggling a lot of things to um, say, let's just flop down and watch something on Netflix. And there's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes I think the escape from everything that's going on can be really useful. Um, I think in terms of ways of spending quality time, I think it really comes down to uh, doing things that you enjoy with your partner um, and maybe things that you haven't, haven't done before, you know, find a hobby that you enjoy together. Um, you know, playing a game together, talking about things, um, going for walks if you can do that. Um, and so I think just things that really allow you to connect and get to know your partner. Um, you know, finding out kind of what's on their minds. I mean, I know sometimes for me, it's like life is like, okay, what are we making for dinner? And who's going to go to the grocery store? And what about this and that? Um, but kind of slowing down and just saying, hey, let, let's just kind of talk about stuff or um, find something that you enjoy doing and try to do that together. So I think that there can be ways to really have this quarantine be nurturing for a relationship, particularly if you're able to really spend time together with your partner in ways that are enjoyable and productive. Um, so I see a question that says tips on being physically present but not necessarily available throughout the workday. I find it requires more attention when I'm doing administrative work. Yeah, physically present. Yeah. So um, so I'm being physically present. So I'm thinking about this. Yeah, so I think that um, that's hard. You know, if you're working from home and you are doing something that, you know, you're there, but you're not really able to be present. Um, and particularly if you're doing things that do require a certain amount of attention um, that you can't just quick get up. And, and I think those interruptions are things that a lot of people are experiencing in terms of working at home. Um, I think one thought that I had would be to try to see if you can create a schedule or set up your day in such a way that you do have kind of check-in points um, or points where you can kind of tag team or relieve each other, um, so to speak, so that, um, you know, you can help each other out. But I think, I think those check-ins and kind of coming up with a little schedule, one thing that could be really useful is having kind of a morning meeting of saying, okay, here's how the day is going to line up. Here's where I'm really available. And here's where I'm really not. Like, so for example, this morning, I told my husband, I said, I'm going to be doing this thing. Nobody can interrupt me. After that, I can be interrupted. And so we kind of worked through that and had a conversation about how to do that. So to me, I think it really comes down to kind of planning um, and then having check-ins and maybe trying to structure your day where you can kind of come in um, and be more physically present before having to kind of step back out. Um, let's see, another question is, could you talk more about finding that balance when your personalities are very different? Yes, one is totally fine in socialization, the other is really missing the social interaction and being out. So yeah, so I think that um, for couples who are matched in that way, this may be, you know, this is fine. Um, but I think that when you do have a mismatch of personalities, that can really create create a lot of strain. Um, and one of the ways that can create strain is somebody who is really extroverted may be really, you know, 
hey, I want to talk. I want to do stuff. Let's be together. And the, the person who is more introverted may be like, whoa, this is too much. Um, and, and that can be, be stressful for them. I think what's important for people who have different personalities are a couple things. One is to remember that you do have different personalities and to acknowledge that and to be open about that, to say, you need more social interaction than I do, or even this is harder for you than it is for me. And to really understand how that person is experiencing it. And so not to be invalidating. So to say to the person who's fine and so who's fine being isolated, like, what's wrong with you? Like, or the person who really wants to be out and who is missing social relationships to say, like, why is this such a big deal to you? It is a big deal. So I think acknowledging and validating that is, is important, number one. I think for people who are really extroverted, I think this is a really important time to get creative around finding ways of staying socially connected while being socially isolated. So, you know, do you have a group of friends that you can schedule like some kind of a chat um, to call up? I got a text yesterday from a friend that I don't think I've talked to in 15 years. Um, so, you know, we've just kind of lost touch and this person reached out and we had a great conversation. Um, and so I think, you know, for people who are more extroverted and really are missing that social interaction, I think your partner can be part of that, but it's also important not to expect them to do all of it because I think that can create strain and tension. So finding ways to connect to a family, you know, maybe you have extended family and you get together for, you know, a family dinner or um, might, you know, have, have somebody that you might play a game with online. There are options for watching movies together with people. So I think that trying to build in those kinds of connections can be really, really important. Um, let's see, we're, we're homeschooling, but set aside time after five for evening walks, family game night, move night, individual quiet time, being intentional about your needs is essential. Absolutely. I think that's a great suggestion. Um, I like several things about that is one is being intentional about how you're spending your time. It kind of gets back to what I suggested about having a little bit of a schedule for your family and for your, you as a couple of this is kind of how our day goes. And within that building in time to do enjoyable things together as a family and even as a couple. Um, and just being clear and intentional about making sure that everybody's needs are met. So saying at the dinner table, you know what? If somebody needs to take a break, and, and go be by themselves for a little bit, that's okay. Um, and, and making it be okay to talk about, you know, today's just not going well for me, or, you know, I'm doing better today. And so I think that that intentionality is really important and, and building in things that are enjoyable. If you have the time and resources, it's a great way to, to do some things you don't normally do um, and, and to kind of slow down and have more time together and try to enjoy that time, recognizing that it also can be pretty stressful as well. Other questions or thoughts, resources for couples who feel they need therapy now. Um, so some of it depends on where you're located. Um, most practitioners that I know right now have shifted to doing telehealth. Um, if you're looking for um, resources, there are good options for searching for therapists on Psychology Today. Um, the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy has a therapist finder feature, um, and you can put in your zip code and it can bring up people um, in your area. Word of mouth is usually a good way um, to find clinicians as well. Um, it's a, but like I said, it's a little hard to, um, because I know people are from all over, um, but many, many providers, couples therapists, people who are licensed as marriage and family therapists are going to have expertise in working with couples. Um, and most people, like I said, are doing sessions just like this over Zoom, and that can be a really good, a good way. And, you know, if you if you feel like you need support right now, I think it's great to reach out. Um, and some, and just having another person to kind of talk through things with um, can be very helpful um, and can also help prevent things from getting, getting worse. Um, let's see, somebody posted that their family does a, a planned one hour of me time each day when they don't have to interact with other members of their family. Yeah, exactly. That was what I was getting at with the, you know, take breaks. You know, if that, that works for you, that's great. You know, I, I you know, both of my kids, they go to their rooms um, and, and just have a little time there, you know, 
maybe you go for a walk or spend some time in your house where it's just something that you enjoy doing. And I think having that break um, becomes really, really important. Um, our family checks in at breakfast to give a daily plan or schedule. Lunchtime, we talk about what's happening after the workday and what's for dinner. Yes, always the what's for dinner. But yeah, that, that idea of kind of having check-ins um, and kind of having a plan for the day, I think, is, is really important. Um, particularly for couples to sort of, you know, perhaps if you're juggling, like, okay, I'm going to help with schoolwork right now. You're going to jump in at this point if you're able to do that. Um, but I think that's really where communicating and having plans become really important um, because otherwise I think days can be just come way too unstructured. Um, and I think that for some people, you know, I, you know, I think there is some people are like, oh, you know, now's the chance to, you know, clean out your garage um, or other kinds of things like that. I think it's important to recognize that, you know, for some people, you know, tackling big household projects or other kinds of things may not be really what they can manage right now, and that's okay. Um, but for some people, that's really a productive way uh, of coping, and, and, and they enjoy that. And so I think making kind of room for different ways that people are managing the stress of the current pandemic is really important, too. So what may work for one person may not work for somebody else. Let's see, I started having weekly Zoom happy hours with friends um, to connect with people. Yeah, um, a friend planned a Zoom reunion for our high school lunch table. Oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah, so those are great examples of ways of staying socially connected while we're isolating. You know, Zoom happy hour, I love the Zoom reunion for the high school lunch table or friends from college or whatever. Um, people from church, whatever your social communities that are supportive happen to be, I think can be a really great way to stay connected and can kind of take the strain off um, the people that are under the roof with you um, because you're having that opportunity to, to talk to and interact with others. Um, so that's a really great suggestion. I really like that one as well. Other things that people have found work, challenges that they've run into, questions that you have. Oh, great. One grandma is scheduling arts and crafts by Zoom with grandkids across the country to give couples some time and interact with them. So that's a great idea of a grand, you know, having a grandparent sort of take, quote unquote, take the kids for a little bit so that couples can have some time together. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good example as well. There are also some really good, you know, virtual field trips that kids can do. Um, that could be ways to just grab a, even if it's just a cup of coffee or just a chance for, you know, 10 minutes to sit down um, with your partner or by yourself, that can be really useful as well. Um, and I think it's a good time to sort to really understand, you know, kind of what, what does charge you up? What is really self-care for you? You know, sometimes I think we can be victims of sort of mindless scrolling on our, our devices. You know, that may not really re refuel us. And so really doing things that really do charge you up, exercising, you know, reading, prayer, whatever happens to really be helpful for you, I think is important to really be intentional about doing those things. Um, because I think that's important. Visible stressors spilling over to home time can be challenging. Yeah. And, and I think that that is one of the things that I think is, is really hard right now is there is very little separation um, between work stress, home, home things, coronavirus being kind of war anxiety about just what's going on out there, being worried about um, family members. Um, so yeah, I think that um, those kinds of stressors can be really difficult and, and having them spill over. I think one of the things that I would say about spillover is that um, sometimes kind of boundarying that time can be useful. So perhaps you and your partner set aside a time to kind of talk about the stress that you're experiencing and how it's infecting you and then kind of saying, okay, we're gonna take a break from this and sometimes, and then come back to it later so that it doesn't just kind of go everywhere into the relationship. So trying to set some boundaries around that if you're able um, and, and recognizing that, you know, maybe you need to, to take a little bit of a break at, at the moment so that those, those stressors aren't kind of spilling out throughout the family. Um, and that can be, 
be valuable as well. But it is it is hard to kind of keep everything separate. Um, I've read a lot of suggestions that, you know, turn off the news for a day um, or just kind of, if you need to, just kind of take a break from media, social media. That can be really important for um, reducing that spillover as well. Um, I've been working with blended families, more stress and resentment. Oh, blended families, that's a tough one. Um, so for blended families, you know, one of the challenges is you may have your kids, my kids, our kids can be in the mix and that can already create some tension. Um, depending on how long the blended family has been together, you know, they may not really have established uh, routines, patterns, um, rules as a family, um, and their relationships may not be as strong um, as blended families are kind of getting started and getting to know each other and, and establishing those um, connections. I think with blended families, I could probably talk about this for quite a long time. I think what I would say is I think it's really, I think the communication becomes really important. I think it's really important for blended families to be careful of Kind of taking sides or lo divided loyalties that kind of create an us against them sort of structure within the family. So I think it's really important for couples and blended families to be um, be on the same team with each other around parenting decisions, um, parenting, and it may mean renegotiating things temporarily. Um, it may be, okay, this is how we're going to do this for right now, but this may not be what we want to do forever. Um, but I think couples really trying to be on the same team and to be unified as much as possible is important, but that can be very challenging, um, particularly when, um, when children from multiple previous relationships kind of get in the mix, because I think there can be loyalty issues there that can be, be difficult. Um, the counseling question, um, some EAP resources, that's great. Thank you for um, posting that resource, that's really helpful. Um, somebody posted, I think this has been an opportunity for us to truly see and understand our partner's work, appreciate the strain they may be under, and then cool things they do with their job. Yes, I think that's a really great point, is that um, you know, we also have an opportunity to really appreciate the work that each other does um, and to kind of get to know them and see them in a different way. And I think that's really kind of neat. Um, and to really express that gratitude and appreciation to them as well to say, wow, like I didn't know that that's what you did. I mean, you know, hearing your partner perhaps in a meeting or seeing them in their sort of work mode, I think can be, be really very revealing. Um, and so to kind of share those, those impressions with them and, and that appreciation I think is important. A stressor of one spouse working, one is not. Absolutely. I think those mismatches um, can be, be really difficult, um, whether it's a mismatch in personality, a mismatch in somebody working, um, a mismatch in how stressed people are. Um, I've heard the stories of one, you know, where one couple's person in the couple is really worried and the other person's like, eh, this isn't a big deal. Um, and, and all of those mismatches are, are important. I think when one spouse is working and one is not, I think it's very important in those cases, again, to kind of come up with what is our plan? What is our schedule? Making sure that when the spouse who is working is done, they don't just have to automatically jump into parent household and that's the time off for the other person and vice versa, you know, both people need time to take a break, to do enjoyable things. And I think it's important to try to, to kind of coordinate things um, in a way that both people are able to have some time to themselves, um, are dividing up whatever responsibilities needed to be divided up in a way that feels fair. It may not be 50-50, but in a way that feels, that feels fair to people. Um, and then really staying in communication um, so that people's needs are being met. All right, how about couples that one partner is still working out, but the other outside of the home, the other is working from home, the work from home partner is keeping house, yes. Yeah, so the, you know, with different partners kind of carrying different loads. So you may have one partner that is still having to work outside of the home and the other is sort of juggling everything else. I think in those cases, I think the appreciation piece um, of what was posted there is important of really acknowledging 
each person's contributions as well as the stressors and challenges that they're experiencing, I think is important. Um, because I think what we really want to know is that our partner sees and appreciates what we're trying to do right now and how we're trying to help out. And so I think acknowledging that is really important. I think that when one partner is sort of carrying a lot of the load, I think it can be really important for that person to be able to articulate their needs in terms of taking a break or getting some help. And I think for the other person to recognize that, you know, being home all day and doing the work and the kids and homeschooling, it, it can be exhausting um, and try to jump in and help in ways that they can. I mean, this is really one of those times where I think, you know, couples may have to really renegotiate what they're used to doing um, and really and try to work together to support each other so that nobody's really carrying all of the load. You know, maybe the person who is from home, you know, needs to get out for a little bit, take a drive, um, or go for a walk if that's a possibility, or have some time with friends or a little time to themselves. And so trying to negotiate that in a, in a spirit of support and cooperation, I think is really important. The additional challenge of cancellation of spring break, planned family gatherings, um, I think that's really hard. And I think that there's grief that is happening for couples and families right now. Um, you know, grieving the loss of being able to do things that you really would enjoy doing. And I think making space to talk about that and to be okay to be sad and angry about that, I think is really important. Um, and to perhaps plan fun things that you can do at home. So, you know, what would an at home spring break look like? You know, I was joking around about making milkshakes for breakfast, you know, one day, you know, what are the things that could be be fun? And maybe to use the time to think about what what things might you want to do when we can all start moving around a little bit more? What will be some things that you'll do to celebrate? And, and what are some ways you can build enjoyment into little ways into your day to day? Yes, my partner is working outside the home right now and he has had the added stress of being afraid of catching COVID. Um, yes, that is that is a huge stressor for couples. You know, perhaps, you know, one person being at risk for, for getting the virus and bringing that home. And um, I think just being able to talk about those fears and having plans in place if somebody were to get sick um, and how you handle that, how you'll handle that, I think is important. But yeah, that is... That is really hard. And the stress of people who are working in essential jobs, healthcare workers, it's, it's a very stressful time. And I think really finding out what they need when they're home to recharge and deal with their own anxiety and stress that they're dealing with, I think is an important piece um, so that when they're going out into the world, they, they are doing as well as they can be expected. Um, yeah, the it, I just think it's it, a lot of you are mentioning, yes, that added stress of one person being really concerned about catching the virus when the others are working from home. And um, yeah, I just think it's a matter of really being able to talk about those fears, make it, putting them out there so that they're not hidden, um, but being able to dialogue about them, share how you're feeling, um, ask what the person needs to feel supported. Um, and, and putting in procedures in place, if you can, around, you know, how you will take care of yourselves if somebody were to get sick um, and what resources that you might need. But yeah, that is, that is a tough situation um, and, uh, and certainly a big source of stress. Yeah, these are great questions. Anything else that comes up for people? Oh, yes. High school and college graduation being canceled. I know on Friday, um, the session will focus on with teens, but I think that for a lot of families, you know, those milestones and those rituals that really are very important in our lives um, because they help us make meaning of significant events, we're not able to do those. And I think that again, you know, talking about that, um, allowing the negative feelings um, that they're okay. It's okay to be really angry and disappointed about that. Um, and, you know, are there ways of creating something that's not going to be the same? I mean, of course it's not. Um, but to mark those events and to acknowledge those events in a way that would be meaningful, um, I think can be very useful. And Crystal just posted the Balancing Life, Teens, Anxiety, and Stress. Um, and I think that one's a, that should be a really good webinar on Friday. 
Um, also make a plan on how to disinfect the house every day when they come home, close in the washer, take a shower, doorknobs, um, agreeing to social distancing, hand washing, not touching face when they're out at work. Yeah, that's a, those are great, very concrete tips. If you have a partner who's working outside of the home um, for how to um, try to prevent transmission of COVID um, and just kind of coming up with a with a plan or a system um, to try to protect people in the household. Absolutely. Those are great suggestions. Thank you. I think some people may have discrepancies in sort of how they feel about social distancing um, and what that actually means. And I think that you know, if, if you have concerns um, or there is a mismatch with your partner, I think it's really important to talk about and come to some kind of agreement on, you know, what, what you feel comfortable with and what you don't. Um, and if, and how you will, you know, kind of disinfect your home or what, what precautions you may put in place um, in terms of um, making sure to try to keep pe people healthy in your home. I think that's important as well. All right, well, it looks like we are winding down. Um, thanks to all of you for joining today. I hope that you've gotten some tips and that this has been helpful um, to you. You know, I think this is all new stuff for a lot of us to navigate and, and I will certainly be sending you all good, good vibes and good energy as we navigate this this kind of new normal and I encourage you all to take good care of yourselves and your partners and really focus on how you can can be a team um, and really look out for one another and so i hope everyone stays safe and healthy and and thank you very much um, and i hope you have a good rest of your day thank you so much for these amazing tips i've certainly jotted down a lot of ideas and and um, just thinking about different ways of, of doing things um, we hear about I statements a lot, but one of my takeaways I'll just share with you is the we statement. Mm -hmm. And I think we do it sometimes, but we don't call it that. But so the intentionality of thinking about a we statement um, right. is one of, one of my key takeaways. So thank yeah. you so much for being on. <laughs> yeah, you're very welcome. And not making a we statement a sneaky you statement, right? <laughs> of, we need you to do more <laughs> around the house. It is a we we're living in a house that doesn't feel very clean right now. How can we work together on that? So yeah, <laughs> but I'm glad that that was helpful. Good, good, good. All right. Well, thank you so much. And um, I put up some information about the session on Friday, Teens Anxiety and Stress. So certainly check that out. And everyone, I see things popping up in the chat, but thank you um, again so much, Dr. Doba McNabb, for these You're amazing very welcome. tips. Uh, and we will look to post this recording on the Virginia Cooperative Extension website. And at this point, we will close out the session and everyone enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Bye.